there was a lot of fear growing up. And I think a part of it had to do with being a daughter of immigrants and the language barrier. I grew up speaking Chinese as my first language. I think always being seen and heard differently was was hard. And the reactions that you get from people when you have an accent in the beginning, I think that was a little tough growing up. And so I just had that fear built in me of like the judging and I think as kids, you just want to fit in. I just always had that internal like weight on me. Well, hey, everybody, we are back. We haven't been recording our podcast for a few weeks as we took our sons off to college. This is the first episode of season two. It's the Speak With Presence podcast where perfection is overrated, good guys listen, and real women lead to influence change. I'm Jen Belenga. And I'm Jennifer Rutley Thomas. Not only are we co founders of Voice First World, but we are also the co host of, yes, the Speak With Presence podcast. JRT, are you so excited to be back? It's very exciting. We are partnering with William and Lauren. This is a custom made to measure clothing company in Oklahoma City. Lauren Workentine, we will be having on the podcast soon, but she is uh, sponsoring the podcast and we are showing off our amazing jackets with the logo liner. So we're very proud of them. How, how's it going since the last time we've been on here? <laughs> well, it's going good. We've been in many places. We've done uh, some traveling, meeting with some other powerful women, so more to come on that, both on our Facebook group and on our podcast. But, you know, we have been very excited about the partnership um, with William and Lauren. Uh, Take a few minutes. We'll share a link in the notes below. As a woman that has monkey arms, uh, it has been the first time in my life where I have found a jacket that actually fits me. And we talk a lot about confidence and we talk a lot about self-esteem and when you actually put on a jacket that fits rather than things that um, hug you in places that shouldn't or they're too big, it feels pretty empowering. So it's been a, a great partnership and, and way to um, help women just feel great about themselves in all aspects of their lives. I've been calling this the confidence blazer. Just the confidence blazer. We're all in the confidence business. So it's it's pretty amazing. So yay to uh, William and Lauren Company and us for getting to partner with her. So today we have another powerful speaker, Jenny Poon. What do you know about Jenny Poon, JRT? Well, holy cow. I mean, I was doing some reading over the last couple of weeks and I just sat there going, we need her in Kansas. So Jenny is an entrepreneur. But what I love about her also is how she describes herself as an equity advocate But most notably, she's known as the founder of Hub, which is a citywide entrepreneurial platform, which hits home for you, Jen and I. But before Hub, she was co-founder or co-founded, excuse me, Cohoots, which is a purpose-driven co-working and entrepreneur center. So she's doing amazing work. Uh, We're going to hear more from her today about that. But just incredible when we think about she was doing this pre-COVID I can only imagine the story she can share as we transitioned and and where she is today and the in the impact she's making for women and minority groups. Yes, she is incredible and it's it's funny when you ask what's the website we could share and she's like, "Well, I've got three because she's that kind of entrepreneur. She's got her own, she's got Cohoots co-working and she's got Hub, the entrepreneurship platform that she'll talk about as well." You know, in thinking about introducing her today, There was somebody that wanted to come forward and share a few words about her as a powerful woman, as a powerful leader, um, and as a mentor. So Jen, would you mind sharing that before we bring Jenny forward? Yes. Oh, we're all Jennifers. Jenny, JRT, Jen, it's a Jen day. All right. Here's the quote for Jenny. There's so much to say about Jenny. Um, The first time I met Jenny, she was pregnant with her second child, multitasking our meeting with her lunch and running two businesses all with the warmest smile and gave me the most welcoming hug. She's like an infectious and expansive well of ideas, and just being around her gets your creativity swirling. She's a problem solver, a connector, a cheerleader, and a deep thinker. She's kind and warm and somehow always finds a way to nurture her family, her businesses, and her employees without leaving anything behind. She's a doer and she's unafraid. In one word, Jenny Poon is an inspiration. That is from Meg Zemlicka or Zemlicka. 
And let's bring Jenny Poon on. Here's Jenny. Wow, that was what a wonderful surprise. That's so kind. Of course, it's so good to hear from people who see the power and the impact that you're making in your community. So that's from Meg. Welcome, Jenny. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Let's start off with asking you a little bit about being an entrepreneur and a mom and and having several businesses in the Phoenix area. Could you just give us the short um, story of your your bio? If, if they want to read the full bio, they can always go to the show notes. But just to get our listeners thinking about who you are and where you come to us from. Sure. I'm originally from Minnesota. Uh, my parents are refugees from Vietnam and they landed in Minnesota and I grew up in their small business restaurant. So they started a restaurant when I was a kid, grown up around small business and entrepreneurship. And my parents had always said, don't become an entrepreneur because it is the hardest thing you should ever, you will ever do. <laughs> um, so they steered me very far away from being an entrepreneur, but I went to college. I did all the things that they wanted me to do. And um, in t- 2009, when the recession hit, I lost my job. Um, the publishing company, the newspaper that I was working for, shut down the magazines that I was um, art directing at the time, and I decided to become an entrepreneur. So I started a marketing company. It got really busy, and uh, at that time, I also realized I knew how to do some of the basic things as a small business owner because I had been around it, but I didn't really know how to grow it. And so uh, I looked for people who were in the same space, who were hiring people, who were navigating the challenges that I was nav- navigating and just tried to cling to that like little circle of people to, to learn how to do things better. And that eventually came, became Cahoots, which is the first co-working space in Phoenix. I didn't even know what co-working was, but I needed to, a place to bring people together and to learn how to do these things better. And then, you know, I I thought I had the best idea. I was like, this is the most brilliant thing ever. And then I did a quick Google search and realized co-working did exist. It was still really early on. Um, I don't think WeWork even existed at that time. Uh, But there were co-working spaces that existed. And so then I, you know, got involved in some of the early groups that were building a national concept of co-working, then started educating people on what co-working was. And again, moving through how do we help entrepreneurs build businesses better. That took up, Cahoots took up so much of my time that I eventually turned that into my full-time business, which was never meant to be a business. Uh, It meant to be like a a side project that we would just share space, like this beautiful communal, communal like concept. But I realized pretty quickly that it needed somebody to spearhead it and it needed a lot of time and energy. So I took that on. And then in the middle of the pandemic, we got a call from our municipalities asking for us to partner with them on helping the small business community. And I was already building a platform to kind of connect resources that um, we've gathered at Cahoots over the years. Uh, And so I kind of worked with our economic development departments that had reached out around like what, what immediate things could we do to help small businesses. And we built this tool called Hub, which is a digital platform. Um, it kind of takes everything we've learned from our co-working space and puts it into a digital space so that people who can't access our physical space can access that community online, can access the entrepreneurship training that we provide, um, and then also access funding and grants that are provided by the cities that we operate in. Um, so it kind of, it's that next iteration of all the things that I've been working on. and. And kind of builds off of the things that I've learned and grew up with being in an entrepreneur family. So that's where I am now. I have two children. I have a husband. Um, We live in Phoenix. And um, we're just constantly thinking about how we can better serve our community. Well, I just think it's incredible in looking at your work. And, you know, maybe this has even changed since some of the statistics on your page. But it appears that... Cohoots is ranked number four co working space in the nation. That's incredible considering everyone that's in or attempting to get into this industry. Yeah, I think we were very surprised by that. We're also the on that ranking, the only one that isn't a national space. Um, so I think like the first was, gosh, I don't even remember. I know WeWork was on there, but we're the first on there that isn't a national conglomerate like invested 
highly invested venture capital space. So I think it it speaks to the work that we do. And I think the big thing is we're not just a, a physical space. We do a lot of entrepreneurship support as a part of that work. Yeah, that really speaks to your your passion for entrepreneurship, that connection of your body of knowledge between being an entrepreneur and being a family of entrepreneurs and thinking about space. That's such a beautiful match. Um, I know you've gone on the speaking circuit. Do you feel like you are doing more speaking than growing what you've got going in Phoenix? Or where do you feel like most of your time goes, especially when you look at being a mom of two kids and one who's not even a year old yet? Where are you spending most of your time? Oh, I spend a lot of my time on Hub right now. Um, my husband has stepped up over this last year. We, I founded Cahoots, but he joined in, uh, three or four years later um, and has really been the the co-founder with me like every everything i know he knows outside of i probably crawl through the the ceiling tiles and like navigate the air conditioning system better than he does um as you should thank you <laughs> um but he we've over this last year kind of gone through a transition um because it's i can't I can't juggle being CEO of two organizations. And so we've been going through this transition where he's stepping up as the CEO of Cahoots. And I've kind of, I'm, I'm just a better builder, um, like early stage builder. Once we get into sustaining and, and, and like studying a space, um, I kind of get a little bored. And so that's why Hub was born and Hub is in the growth stage right now. And, um, we're growing nationally. And so I spend a lot of my time on Hub. And if you were to ask me about the speaking circuit, honestly, this has only happened over the last couple of months. Like I look at my schedule over the next month and it is booked every week with some speaking opportunity. Maybe it's because you guys reached out to me early on and put that little seed <laughs> into my calendar and now it's flourishing. Um, I do do a lot of speaking, Everybody has always asked me to do it, but inside there's just this, like, I've always been the shyest girl um, growing up. I remember my parents asking me to go order hot dogs at the, like, the food court at the mall and breaking down and crying because I was worried about having to ask for what I wanted <laughs> in front of somebody else. Um, and I remember being in class and uh, my daughter actually has a similar story and the teacher saying like, we have never heard her voice. Um, and the first time they would hear it, they're like, oh, that's, that's what she sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, my daughter, at, my teachers have told, told us a same, the similar story. They have like, it took months before they heard my daughter actually speak. Um, and so there was a lot of fear growing up. And I think a part of it had to do with being in uh a daughter of immigrants and the language barrier. I grew up speaking Chinese as my first language. Uh, and so, you know, I think always being seen and heard differently was, was hard. Um, and the reactions that you get from people when you have an accent in the beginning, um, or you don't know exactly what the terminology is for things. Um, I think that was a little tough uh, growing up. And so I just had that fear built in me of like the judging and I think as kids you just want to fit in and um I just I always had that internal like weight uh, on me I don't know eventually how I broke out of it I think it had to do a lot with just doing more of it um and getting comfortable getting comfortable was sitting there and being forced to have to do this on again and again and again, right? Um, I think also just there's a level of experience over time when you've said the same things and you're familiar with the industry you're talking about. Like throw me in a room to talk about biology and I would be that four-year-old girl that won't ask for the hot dog. Um, but throw me in a room and talk about entrepreneurship, about women leadership, about um, about equity or race issues. And like, I feel like I am, those are my strengths. And, and I think that's the key is just feeling very comfortable in the topics that you, you can own. Absolutely. That's a good place to ask you, what kind of bias have you had to overcome as an entrepreneur, or as a woman in the workplace? Yeah. Back 
early on, um, I was asked when I was running my marketing company and I had um, four staff members on my team, I was asked to join this nonprofit brainstorming session with their, their board. Um, and I walk into that room and I'm, I'm Asian, right? Like it's pretty obvious I'm Asian. So I, I typically look 15 years younger than I actually am. Um, <laughs> and I'm in with my team, which was like, I think a, a white man that was the same age as I was. Um, and then two other staff, like interns and a designer, I think, um, that joined us. And we were just meant to sit in the back and, and listen. And I walk in and one of the board members immediately says, oh, so you guys are here from the design company? And I said, yes. And he immediately starts talking to the white man employee um, of my company. And he was like, wow, well, what, wow. how did you guys get here? What is, what is this company about? Tell me more. And I'm sitting here just watching the whole situation roll out. And, you know, eventually I step up and I say, well, like, you know, I enter the conversation and I kind of take over. Then we sit back down and they discuss this whole, um, whole project. And the project was actually about reaching more young leaders. How do we encourage more young leaders to be a part of our nonprofit organization? And so they specifically invited me because I was growing into that space. And so they Again, I was just meant to, we were just meant to sit there and listen. But then there was a point where the moderator stopped and said, Jenny, what are your thoughts on all this after you've like heard everything that we've discussed and brainstormed? And I said, well, like, you know, I've only heard of your organization from other people. And when I've heard about it from other people, the reputation you have is it's an old boys club. And so I think you have to, you have to address that and you have to combat that and you have to work on your messaging to diffuse that that message, even if like visually and the people you're bringing in are, are different. And so there was a little bit of a silence and then somebody from the board raised his hand and it was a different man, but he, it was, it was mostly men raised his hand. And he said, I don't mean to be rude, which is the preface for being rude. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to be rude here real quick. I remember being your age and um, and having the same kind of perception about myself. Um, and honestly, and he's now speaking to the board, honestly, I don't think um, she is what we're looking for in this organization. And um, I think we really need to look at, you know, like what, what, what kind of people we're trying to attract. And I was just, it was one of those moments where, and, and he said, so, so he said the thing and I was just like jaw dropped, didn't, deer in headlights, didn't even know how to respond to that. And later the, the moderator, like there was a little bit of a discussion, I think some back and forth around like, do people agree with what he's saying? The moderator stops everything. And here's where like you see an ally step forward. She stops everything and she says, no, actually we specifically invited Jenny here because she is the target demographic for this. She's networked with all of the people that we have been talking about trying to attract. And she's exactly what we're looking for. And so she stepped up and said that. And I was like, okay, great. And then after this whole thing was done, the man comes back up to me and he says, sweetheart, Oh, man. I, I wish you luck with everything you're doing um, and enjoy that youth. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Uh. <laughs> and it's one of those one of those experiences that, like, I think I dream about almost every month. And I'm like, what would I have said? What would I have ad- done differently? Um, and I still I still I'm just I'm constantly shocked at the blindness that people have around the words that come out of their mouth and the, and how do you get somebody to understand this other view of the world? And um, so that's, that's my story. And I'm grateful for the, the moderator who I've become good friends with, who stopped the entire conversation in front of her board. Like she was, it's not, she wasn't the board member. She was, you know, she was a, a person contracted to come in and help them navigate this who stepped up and, you know, was the voice when I couldn't literally speak. <laughs> she could be an ally also because for sure she's witnessed the same thing. Yeah. What a great story of allyship and also just shock, but it shouldn't shock us. But that's why we like to share these stories because there's, there's so many 
allies out there who are ready to do the good work to make sure that there's more inclusive spaces. And so they need to hear these stories and go, okay, what would I do in that situation to, to provide a better experience for an amazing entrepreneur, businesswoman, just person in business who doesn't deserve that kind of um, bias against them. So yeah, what a wonderful story. Thank you for that. I counted them. You've received over 24 different awards for your work and your leadership, I think since 2010. And I would question if he has made that type of contribution in his community, in your community, in the community. So kudos to you and what you've accomplished no matter when that's happened. Thank you. You talked about doing a lot of more speaking, maybe over the last month or even last two years. Can you talk about a time when you really did feel like a powerful speaker, despite maybe how you felt over the years about speaking? And what do you feel were the actions that you took to make that possible? Yeah, this ties back to that that um, meeting that I had, right? Um, I think something, this might sound really terrible, but something that has really fueled me is those moments where I didn't have my voice, right? I didn't know what to say. And and thinking about the man that thought I was this little girl who didn't know anything, right? And so, you know, a little bit of it, of building up my confidence is around spite, right? Like, I want to show these people who doubted me that I can accomplish a lot. And so I, you know, I sit there and I, I think, I get, I get a little angry about the situations and the world that we live in. And that fuels the work that I do, the speaking that I do, the passion that I have when it comes to speaking about these things, because I've experienced all of those things. And <laughs> the inequities is, is just, if we have the ability to change some of those things in our lifetime, we should spend a lot of energy in doing that. And the fuel comes from experiencing those inequities myself. So I, I, I think some of that, but in terms of preparation, having spite and, and going through the really crappy stuff is, is part of it. Um, but in preparation, you know, I used to think, I, I used to like write down exactly what I wanted to say um, when I would go in to speak about something. And that would end up actually tripping me up more than actually mentally preparing and not writing things down. So now I've gone to the point where I just take short notes and I just write down like three points that I want to make sure that I cover. And as long as I cover those three things, I feel pretty good about myself. The one experience that has actually convinced me to continue doing more speaking is I was invited to speak I, at one of these award things. And I will tell you, I never watch myself after I've like done the speaking thing when they push out the video I'll happily share it but I will never <laughs> watch myself my husband will turn it on in the background and I'll run over and I'll slam his computer shut and I'm like I don't want to hear it it's just it's I have not gotten to that point where I'm comfortable hearing myself the one moment that continues to like that helps encourage me to keep doing this is I was invited to speak at a at an awards event I don't remember what the the category or what I really needed to cover. I think it was just open-ended, but they said, you have two minutes. You can't go over two minutes. We're going to cut you off. I was the only woman that won an award and I was the only woman that kind of prepared something or the only person that actually prepared something. I wrote this thing and I practiced it. I wrote everything out. I practiced it and I practiced it again and again. I couldn't get it under two minutes. And so I was like, ah, oh, forget it. When I got up there, I just read like parts of it. And then I just like threw it away. Um, I ended up going to like five minutes, <laughs> but they let me go. Uh, and it was, it was just like the story. It was just me speaking about why this was so like the work that I would do is so important right now. And I talked about like the support structures that I had and thanked all the people that made it possible. And, and I know right now I'm not doing a really great job of describing how like wonderful that moment was, but after I stopped and I was, I remember my voice shaking. I remember like, you know, when you speak and you're nervous, my voice was shaking. It was high. I couldn't figure out how to like stabilize it, but I just kept talking. And, you know, I was on the verge of kind of tears and I stopped and I was done and I, everybody stood up and was clapping. Um, I got like the standing ovation. And after that, tons of people came up to talk to me. We got um, part organization started reaching out and wanting to partner with our organization to do more of the work that we're doing. We got this large 
um, sponsorship from um, BBVA Bank, which is now PNC. And it just, it snowballed and it that wasn't the intention at all. But I think if you just, if you know what you're, if you know what you want to talk about and you focus on those three points and you speak from your heart, I think people understand it's impossible to remember. I have the worst memory. So it's impossible to remember everything that you want to say. Focus on two or three points. Very good advice. You just reminded me that we had a a live training we did a couple of weeks ago. And one of the women in the group said, that she identified as an introvert and that she really had, I think she meant monotone, but did she use the word bland voice? Yeah. She used a hand gesture. She said, a very bland voice. Everyone in my family has a bland sort of monotone voice. She goes, we don't really, we don't really, (laughs) how did she, I don't remember even where she went, but she said something like, you know, we don't really have any. And then she got really passionate about it. She goes, we don't really have any sound that goes up or down in our voice. I mean, we're just not that kind of person. We don't have range to our voice. But we we pointed it out to her and said, you just showed us that you did You're that. Like, and, you and just and did it. <laughs> the point is passion. As you said, people respond to passion. And another woman said, I just feel like I'm always so angry. I said, I do it too. JRT knows all the time. I'll be like, but this, this. This thing needs to. She'll look at me. And I'm like, I'm not mad. I'm just mad. I'm not yelling. <laughs> so yeah, I I love that. And and passion accounts for a lot. And there's not enough of it in the world. So what do you find as the solution, or what do you say to women when they want to do a better job with their confidence so that they can speak with presence in the workplace? Do more of what scares you. Um, I think you'll never be good at something until you do more of it. Um, so if, if that's all I could leave you with, I would leave you with that. That's, that's what I've done. It's scary. You screw up a lot. I look back at some of the first few times I had to speak and I, I brought no cards, you know, and I would get really, really nervous and, you know, the voice and I, all of the things would happen, but every single time the next one would roll around and the next one I'd perfect a little bit of, of the challenges that I had before, right? I'd get a little bit better. There's no, I feel like there's no shortcut. You just kind of have to do the hard thing over time. You just get, get good at it. You can't be perfect at everything either. Like you can't, you can't be an expert in everything. So identify the areas where you're a good speaker and that you can speak knowledge, your knowledge, in, the, in those areas. Don't accept any speaking opportunity that isn't in your wheelhouse, right? Um, don't talk about engineering. If you're not an engineer, be ready to say no to those things. I think it's really easy to accept. And I think there's a lot of people that go out asking for, when they, when they look for speakers, they're looking to check the box in a couple areas. And just know that if you're not the right fit for that, it's okay to pass it on. And I would recommend passing it on to another woman or person of color that that truly deserves to be in that spot. If it's not you, be an ally to somebody else and don't be afraid of doing the really, really hard things. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be messy. You'll probably ugly cry after it, but it's okay. You'll get better. And over time, you'll look back and you'll laugh at all the terrible things that you did in the past. (laughs) For sure. For sure. That box checking thing, I, I read between the lines there. I'm sure that in, in in our current times, you've been asked to check a lot of boxes. And I love that you you say, no, thank you, and pass that on. I mean, I, I go back and forth around that. I, I go, well, yeah, I might be the token person on this, but can I open doors? Does that mean that they just start to see more people on these panels? And I'm often like a threefer. I'm, I look young. I don't feel as young anymore, but I look young and I'm a minority and now I'm in this like tech kind of newer space. So people like me aren't usually seen in those spaces. So you go back and forth with, yes, like I'll be on this so that I can show that there are people like me that can fill these seats um, and fill them well. Uh, And at the same time, I think I start to build my list of other people that I can refer them to so that it's not all me. I'm an introvert. This 
kind of stuff drains me. I time block two hours in between, <laughs> like two hours to mentally prep to be to, to be doing this and two hours after because my brain really can't function immediately after being on. Well, we so appreciate you being on our Speak With Presence podcast because your perspective is is really powerful and valuable to our listeners. And I'm happy. I'm I love meeting with people. So if there is anybody who wants to talk about any of these areas that I cover, entrepreneurship, small business building, technology, um, equity work, uh, I am available to chat. Uh, I'm sure my Calendly link is on my website. All right, good. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for your time today. It's been amazing getting to know you. I hope this is not the last time that we see you. We appreciate you so much. Are we going to do like a Gen 3 rally cry of some sort? JRT, that's all you. That's (laughs) all you. That's her love language. Oh, girlfriend. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for being here and we're thrilled to connect you with other powerful women. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you soon. JRT, where's the J- Where's the Gen 3 battle cry? I don't know. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. We'll put it on the to-do list for today. There are so many Jennifers. You can't sling a cat without hitting a Jennifer somewhere. Oh, Lord. Wow, Jen. What a way to start off season two. If you are new to us and you want to know how you can work with us, find out what we do, you can always go to our website, voicefirstworld.com. If you want to talk to us about how we can work together on your speaking engagements, your voice, your power in your spaces as a a leader, you can go to voicefirstworld.com forward slash apply. And we would love to talk to you about that. All right, JRT signing off. Take care. Bye-bye.